train your cabin Read those books in a blink, oh yeah Grab yourself a hot drink cause you're watching how to train your cabin Yep, that's me What would I give to get out of here? What should I do to save me from this place? What can I read to save me from the Bates Lagoon? The only way to get what you want is to read Little Women. <gasps> I can do that? I last left you and I was trapped in Mermaid's Lagoon. Did I escape? I mean, Ursula had some very sound advice that I should read Little Women. And reader, I read Little Women. Once free, the mermaids realise they should not fear you and they allow you passage through Mermaid's Lagoon. So, cheers mermaids for putting me through hell. But yes, I did finish Little Women by Louisa May Alcott and I gave this one five stars. I loved it. First of all, a green screen arrived today. I almost wasn't going to finish reading this just because of this and I really want to play with it but the green screen arrived so that's going to make filming so much more fun. <laughs> it's going to make the next Alcrae Junior unboxing a, a walk in the park really. I'll drink to that. Little Women, what did I think of Little Women? Well, I thought a lot of things. One, I was allowed to. This is going to be a 150 year old spoiler. I'm sure a lot of people know about this, but if you haven't read Little Women and you don't want to be spoiled by it, if you know nothing about what happens to Little Women, I would recommend you skip this video until I put this book down. Okay, so three, two, one. Everybody lied to me. Beth does not die in Little Women. She dies in Good Wives. And Good Wives is part two of this. Part one is Little Women, part two is Good Wives. When I got to the end of Little Women, because I'd got to the end of it, and which was what 200 and so pages into it, I was like, okay, I just want to read Little Women, I don't want to read Good Wives, I just want to read Little Women. And Beth doesn't die, <laughs> in fact, she gets better by the end of it. So I was like, wait, hang on, hang on, so something's not right here. I looked it up and I saw that Beth doesn't die until chapter 40 of like this whole two parter. So there's 47 chapters and Beth dies in part 40, and I was like, why am I just wanting to read this just to say Beth die? What kind of sadistic person am I? But it's not really Little Women if Beth doesn't die. So <laughs> I thought, you know what, right, I'll, I'll just have to read part two then. I'm going to have to read Good Wives because why not? So I did end up doing that, even though part two I feel was longer. Okay, it's hard because I was listening to the audiobook as well as reading along for most of this. And it is a little bit harder to read because it's a classic. But I was so engrossed by the characters, like the character work and everything is what really gave this like the five star for me. It was the character work. Each of the sisters did have a distinctive personality, but I think Beth was so underdeveloped compared to the other three. It felt as if Louise knew she was going to be killing her off anyway. So she was like, well, I don't really need to do much with her. Let's, let's kill her off, you know. Let's not give her the development that everybody else does. I love Jo. I love her and I love her, her drive and her passion because she's extremely intelligent she is very family based as well and i love this is one of the things i love about this book is just how much about family it is yeah there's this great sisterly bond which is why i read this for the mermaid's lagoon prompt and then we have meg and i think a lot of people hate on meg but i didn't mind her that much she learned a lot about humility during this there, I mean, there was that moment where she went all out on buying this dress that they could, like, she couldn't afford. In fact, it wasn't even a dress; it was fabric for a dress that wasn't going to get made. And I, but I kind of relate. I can understand why she did that. She was trying to reclaim something. She didn't want to feel like she was poor or anything. But that did teach her a valuable lesson, you know, especially to do with her husband and how he's been trying to kind of keep them afloat. I mean, obviously this is archaic, but I, I think that's why, why Jo balances this so well, because she is this very driven woman who's, you know, she has her own life ahead of her and she doesn't have to rely on anybody else, whereas Meg is a, a bit of an opposite, but that's absolutely fine. So then also Amy, I, mm, yeah, Amy was good. I love Amy in the movie, not gonna lie, I love Amy in the movie. And in this one, she's not too far off, she's still quite, 
gutsy. There were still mo there were moments in this where I really wanted to shake her though, but it's fair play because she's the youngest. Plot-wise, not a great deal happens, let's not lie, but I was still captivated by it. I was captivated by the setting and the relationship between this family. When Mrs. March gets the girls to look after this really sick family, or like at least help out a bit, having to give up so much, it was really nice. And definitely for the sisters as well to learn kindness and giving back and stuff. But she still puts her daughters in danger because it is a real sickness. A baby dies. A baby dies. And I think on one of the Instagram lives as I was reading this, I got to that point and I was like, oh my God, the baby's dead. The mother exposes her children to this illness. And like, fair enough, you have to help other people and the kindness and all that. It's great. But also... I, I'm not too exactly sure how Beth dies, like what it is that killed her off. I think it was the an illness, but she gets better by the end of Little Women. And then in Good Wives, she falls ill again. But in Little Women, she becomes better. And I think she got the disease from, or the infection from this sick family because she was always one helping. And which, you know, she was a nice person, you know. Beth was really nice. She was a nice one. But I... Unfortunately, the least interesting one out of the th out of the four of them. But yeah, I thought the mum she needed a bit of a wake. Like the mum needed to put her children first sometimes as well. I d I didn't know the balance of that because she was teaching her kids lessons, which was great. But also, I mean, look after your children first. I don't know. But this really got me back into reading classics. I can't wait to read my next classic. I love the writing of this. I really do. It was a little hard to get into at first because it had been so long since I read a proper classic. But I just, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. This will always be a highly rated book for me because of the characters. It was a bit funny when Lawrence ended up with Amy though. But if I hadn't have known that from the movie, then I would have been surprised because I thought Laurie or Lawrence and Joe were endgame, but he ends up marrying Amy. But I kind of, fair, like, I kind of wanted that to happen a bit because I like Joe's independence. Not to say that she has to die a spinster or anything. Yeah, I didn't mind that. I'm not the hugest fan of romance anyway. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm glad I read the second part of this. So, yeah, I'm just going to count this as one book. I'm not going to say this is Little Women and Good Wives, even though it is. I'm just going to count this as one book. I was going to split this in two, and make it so it was the Mermaid's Lagoon prompt and the Deep Woods prompt, because the Deep Woods prompt is pre-2000, and this definitely came out before 2000, I think this came out in 1868 or something like that. So that means I need to move on from the Mermaid's Lagoon and go to my next location. And I'm gonna go to Black Ice Bridge. It's getting unbearably cold. Snow is falling and there's ice everywhere, making it dangerous to even move. You struggle, but you finally reach Black Ice Bridge. In order to cross the bridge safely, you must read a book featuring an expedition or adventure. For this prompt, I will be reading How to Train Your Dragon by Cressida Cowell. It took everything in me not to sing How to Train Your Dragon. So I'm going to read this one. I don't have the audiobook for it and I don't want to waste an audible credit. I'm not going to lie. I mean, everyone's saying that. Obviously, David Tennant was brilliant narrating Wizards of Once. I know he narrates the How to Train Your Dragon series. But when the audiobooks are only like, what, four hours long? I just don't really think it's worth the credit. So I'm just gonna probably read this physically. I do know Cressida has read this herself on her YouTube channel. She's read each chapter. I might just watch that along with it. I'll, I'll try out the first chapter, see how it is, and then and then do that. But I'm looking forward to it. This is apparently different to the movie, How to Train Your Dragon, and I can't wait to find out how. So yeah, this is gonna be my Black Ice Bridge read. Once complete, you cast a spell that will allow you to cross Black Eyes Bridge safely without slipping off. You try not to look down, but before you know it, your final location is before you. Nah, nah, nah. Not yet. <laughs> okay, so I have finished How to Train Your Dragon by Cressida Cal. I read this while I was watching Cressida Cal on her YouTube channel reading this, and it was the purest thing. It was the purest thing. I wanted to re like keep looking at this and reading it physically and all of that, but I just, I didn't want to take my eyes off Cressida as she was reading. She would 
put on the voices and she would do like little movements and things and she would show you the illustrations from the book which was just so great like she was like given like a little commentary as she was like reading and stuff I mean it was mainly the reading so if you want to read how to in your track and it's like the perfect option but she would all say things like I love how fish legs always believes in hiccup and you know it's just like really positive little additions and commentary to it it was just it was brilliant and then one time as well she sneezed and she was just like oh I sneezed and I was like I love her I I think she's amazing I think she's incredible she's such a storyteller and you can really tell through the way she narrates her own story she's just so passionate about it it was so infectious I literally was watching her as if she was like my teacher from school because before my class would start and everything in primary school my form teacher would read us a chapter from like a Goosebumps book or something like that and it just transported me back to the stories being told to me when I was younger and it was just brilliant it was brilliant I'm sorry the lighting isn't that great as well it's quite late and I was just you know in my dressing gown and pajamas and I'm like may as well just film now <laughs> but I really enjoyed this I gave it four stars I thought it was so good I knew it wouldn't be the same as the movie I ended up watching the movie after and I just I could see the the differences but also the similarities and it was just brilliant so in this one the vikings go into this like dragon cave and they pick out a dragon to like sort of train and things it isn't like in the in the movie where dragons are sort of coming into hiccups village stealing food like and then there's like this big fight between dragons and and vikings kind of thing and this one it's not quite like that but we do meet toothless who is like a tiny tiny dragon definitely nothing like the toothless in the movie but that's fine i thought toothless in here was just as charming just as charismatic as well you know it has some attitude so we still have hiccup trying to sort of prove himself to the viking village and to his father and it's a very beautiful story about friendship and believing in yourself it works so well in the movie I mean this came way before it so really I shouldn't even be comparing or anything. So I think a lot of people would enjoy this. It definitely felt the silly end of middle grade sort of like if you not know, for the younger-ish readers and it still had all that imagination that the Wizards of Wands had because I read the Wizards of Wands first, I read it before this and I just thought it was just as whimsical and silly and imaginative. I really enjoy Cowell's illustrations as well. She is such a good illustrator and just captures that childlike imagination and she does it brilliantly in both her writing and her illustrations. I just absolutely, I I adore Cressida Cowell's writing. I really do. She embodies everything that's magical and amazing in middle grade in her works. It's just, yeah, she does it so well. So yeah, I gave this one a four out of five stars and I just know that the rest of the series will just get better and better. So I'm really excited to continue. There's 11 more books I need to read, so I'd better get started. <laughs> but before I do, I do have another location to visit on the map because I don't want to go to the Bookkeeper Stronghold just yet. I want to go to Orion Found. <laughs> the air is much warmer now as you stumble into a desert. The desert mountains seem to hide something, a spaceship that has crash landed. There is a crew of children stuck inside. In order to free the children inside, you must read a sci-fi book or a book related to space. Uh, for the Orion film prompt, I am going to be reading The Infinite Lives of Maisie Day by Christopher Edge. This is about a girl. Actually, no, I'm, I will tell you what this is about when I've read it. Because what I know about this is that she just opens the door on her birthday or something and it's like she's woke up in a black hole kind of thing. It's it's more than that, it's more than that, but that's all I can think of right now. It's very short, so I think I'll get through it quite quickly, but I'll start it tonight before bed and hopefully I will enjoy it. So yeah, this is my Orion Found Prompt book. Once complete, you have the power to open the hatch and free the children. They thank you and help you traverse the rest of the desert until you reach the final location, the Bookkeeper Stronghold. However, 
we are not going there again. <laughs> so yes, I did finish off reading The Infinite Lives of Maisie Day by Christopher Edge, but before I get into my review of this, can I just say, look what came today. <laughs> I'm so happy, but I can't read it until Monday. So it's come. I was kind of hoping it would be delayed so I wouldn't have this temptation right in front of me. But also I was waiting for the postman to come with it because this is the Waterstones exclusive version of it and I was waiting for it to come. There was tracking on it and I knew it would come today but I was still like, oh, but if it's here that means I want to just open it up and if I start reading the first page I'll read it all and I just can't do that. So I need to stop myself because it's believe -a So if you don't know what this is, this is the Hunger Games prequel that's just been released. It was released yesterday, um, but I wasn't expecting to get it on release date, so it's, it's all good. This gave me a bit of an existential crisis, and <laughs> it was it was really weird. I mean, in a good way, in a good way. So chapter one, it's Maisie waking up on her 10th birthday, and she opens that front door, and there's nothing there. It's just all blackness, and even her family are nowhere to be found. It seems like she's the only person in the universe. And then in chapter two, we have Maisie waking up on her 10th birthday again. And this time there is her family there and they're celebrating her birthday and her sister's there. She has an older sister who is a bit distant with her and she seems to have some kind of grudge against Maisie Day because Maisie's very intelligent. She's 10 years old and she's at an open university because she's that smart. If I was her older sister and she was smarter than me, I would probably hold a bit of resentment over her as well. So in chapter three, it goes back to Maisie when she has woken up in this universe where she's the only person. And then chapter four goes back to her celebrating her birthday. So it goes between Maisie waking up on that birthday and nothing being in the universe to Maisie waking up on her birthday and her family being there and everything's normal. So it goes between the two. It's not a ground... I thought at first it would be like a Groundhog Day kind of thing where she'd wake up every morning and it's like her 10th birthday and when she goes to sleep and wakes back up again, it's her birthday again. It's nothing like that. I thought it was at first, but it wasn't. In the parts where Maisie is alone in the universe, the blackness outside is starting to move its way inside and it was really intriguing. I was wondering what was going to happen and because this is so short it was quite quick to get to the action part of it and I found it super super interesting and then even the parts where we go to the normal part of her life where she is actually celebrating her birthday that was a little intriguing and that took a turn that fits together towards the end in a way I kind of wasn't predicting but there was a moment before it happened where I clocked on and then I was like oh my gosh so th that was good I liked that it had a bit of a, a twist thing that I liked couldn't really get away with the writing style it was very direct I said this about the cruel prince and it was like list like I did this I did that I saw this I saw that it was in that way and there was a lot of scientific references that just kind of went over my head which proves like how well researched this is I mean I think anyway it went over my head a bit and it, there was probably a bit too much science stuff mentioned in parts that didn't really have that much relevance I mean it probably did to Maisie because she's really smart to me it just a lot of it just went over my head because of that and it did give me an existential crisis I was thinking all about the universe yeah it kind of messed me up a little bit we also have Maisie's sister Lily who you do start to relate to and it is really nice to see their bond in this at first it's really rocky but then it does become something in the world where Maisie wakes up and everything's normal so it was really good I enjoyed the character exploration of that and I thought it was quite well developed even for a short book I thought the character work in this was actually pretty decent it just I couldn't really get on board with the writing that much I still gave this a fabulous four stars I went through it quickly I started it last night finished it this morning I'm actually going to be doing some more Instagram lives today and I will actually be picking up the next book, which I will get to in a second. But is there anything else I can say about this one that I really want to talk about? It, I think it was worth a read, though, because I did enjoy the twist. I, I'm glad I read it. I was really intrigued by it. It kept my interest all the way through. The first two chapters were a little bit iffy. And then I think by chapter three, I couldn't wait to finish it because it was pretty good. But yeah, I did read it last night and then finished it off this morning. I'm going to do some lives and see where the day takes me really. So that's Orion found and I freed the children from the 
the spaceship. So let's say what place I am heading to next. Buildings surround you, but you ignore them until you reach a chasm that can only be crossed using the brolly rail. Except you don't have a brolly. At the nearby hotel, a young girl offers you hers, but she won't trade easily. In order to gain the brolly, you must read a book featuring transportation or has transportation on the cover. For this one, I will be reading The Lonely Heart of Maybell Lane by Kate O'Shaughnessy, and as you can see, it has a sort of RV camper van on the cover there. And this is also about a young girl who goes on this road trip to find her father. I don't think she's ever known her father. I think her father might have abandoned her when she was a baby, and she never got to see him. But one day, um, she has his voice on the radio because she has his voice from a voicemail or something. And she's always played it. She's always wanted to know him. And she collects sounds. I think it's right. She collects sounds. And then one day she hears him on the radio. He's a radio DJ in Nashville. And he announces there's going to be this competition. A singing competition in Nashville. So May Maisie. I'm going to call her Maisie. It's hard, you know. Because I've just finished reading The Infinite Lives of Maisie Day. And then The Lonely Heart of Mabel Lane. It's similar kind of kind of names similar kind of title it's a little confusing but Mabel she goes on this cross-country trip with a teacher and a bully I think is what it is so I'm excited to say this like what where is her mother why isn't her mother joining on this road trip I will find out is it in the synopsis I want to know but I'll be reading this for the live sprints today so I hope I get most of it read and then maybe finish it tomorrow Now you've done that, the magical girl gives you her brolly and wishes you luck. You step boldly towards your final destination. Oh, that sounds scary. <laughs> and because I've completed The Lonely Heart of Maybell Lane by Kate O'Shaughnessy, I have completed the brolly rail location. However, I am still not going to the bookkeeper's stronghold yet. So Morrigan, thank you for the brolly but you can have it back. So this one is the only contemporary that I've read for Believeathon 2, and I love this. I gave this one four stars. It's yeah, perfect for me though. It is so, so good. The only person I know who's read this on booktube is Chelsea from Chelsea Dolling Reads, and I know she has taste. Like this was so heartwarming, and I definitely needed to read this. Like right now, it's just, it really helped me sort of escape a little bit and to chill and just really fall into Maybelle's world. So I don't think I gave you a proper synopsis of this before. So this does follow Maybelle and she hears her father's voice on the radio and he is a radio DJ in Nashville and she goes on this road trip with Mrs. Boggs and Tommy to Nashville so that she can sing in a singing competition that he's judging. This is pretty much Maybelle's Mrs. Boggs and Tommy's adventure road trip to Nashville. And I love that. I absolutely love that. It started off in Louisiana and then it goes to Nashville. It's it's great. I love that. I have done a bit of a road trip in America before, but not to like this extent or anything. But it did remind me of that. So it gave me some really good memories from that. And it, it was really well written. And because of that, I felt that I was on this road trip with them. So starting off with the characters, I really enjoyed Maybelle as the main character. She was very relatable and she suffers from anxiety and panic attacks. And I thought that was done really well in this. There were some moments where other characters would have to help her. And I think some of the other characters gave us some really good advice that I think a lot of people will be able to take on board in real life. I think it does that 
super well there's like teachable moments and things i absolutely loved the road trip aspect of it so i thought the plot was really good i loved mrs boggs she is a national treasure she I, she comes across as quite cold every now and then but that's because like she's a really tough strong lady and she just doesn't have time for nonsense so she will tell people direct but she also has this really warm inside to her that was really approachable and she's just a fantastic companion on this journey and then we have Tommy who is like the local troublemaker and when he's introduced he's not a very good character he is very horrible to Maybelle but then we see things develop from then on because he joins them on this road trip and the character development in this was very very good I really enjoyed this probably one of the best reads I've read for Believeathon so far with character work I thought it was just done brilliantly and one of my favorite middle grade contemporaries now I, I would say the whole premise of Maybelle going to find her father and talk to him and meet him for the first time took a turn that I didn't really expect to, at the end it was very emotional I will give it that I'm not going to say anything okay I can't say anything I can't say anything because I don't want to spoil it but it was quite emotional and it was very very well written and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. I did. I think it was great. So that is my Broly Rail prompt completed. <laughs> but as I said, Morrigan, you can take that Broly and shove it up because I am making a detour. I've made a good few detours already, but I'm taking another one. The reason I'm taking a detour and no pun intended. When I finished this on Thursday night, still three days left of Believeathon, and I could have just went to the Bookkeeper Stronghold and read my book for that, but I want to listen to the audiobook for that, and I'll reveal what that is later on in the vlog. But I, or if you've watched my TBR video, you'll know what it is. Said I would do some lives on the Friday with some very special guests, so I didn't want to listen to an audiobook doing these lives, so I had to find something that I could read physically and something that I needed to read. So I have picked something else and I'm taking a detour to this next location so that I could do these sprints. So I've decided to backtrack from the Broly Rail and go down to the 100 Acre Wood. As you're walking, you come across a battered book that has been abandoned in the middle of the path. Wary, you approach, only to be pulled inside where you find yourself in the 100 Acre Wood. However, it's completely abandoned. In order to restore 100 Acre Wood, you must read a book with yellow on the cover. Now I totally stole that idea from Kingdom Hearts because I love Kingdom Hearts. So for that one I'm going to read Sal and Gabby Break the Universe by Carlos Hernandez. I needed to read this for Booktube SFF by now but I just hadn't because I didn't own it and I didn't really want to read the Kindle version of it because I don't like reading ebooks and my eyes don't allow to read ebooks for a, for a long period of time. So I decided to read this one for the Friday reading sprints which have happened all day. I had my first guest at 12 and that was Molly at Mind of Molly and then I had Jade at 4 p.m. from JD Ray Reads and then I've literally just I think half an hour ago left the last live and that was with Lexi from Alexandra Roslin. We had a blast all day thank you so much to everybody who joined the lives that was the last live reading sprint so yeah it was it's sad but they've been so good. So anyway I decided to read Sal and Gabby Break the Universe for the 100 Acre Wood prompt because I genuinely do need to read this. So yeah I'm now 168 pages into this. I will tell you everything about what it's about and what I think about this after the montage. <laughs> so in 27 minutes Readathon starts and that is Jade's 24 hour readathon for the whole of Saturday. So it's nearly midnight. I haven't napped and I really wanted to nap. I might nap during the day. I will nap during the day. So that's going to be starting in like half an hour. I still won't be going to the Bookkeeper Stronghold because I want to read Pocket and Stubbs by Sophie Green today in honour of Jade because this is one of Jade's favourite middle grade books. So yeah, I'm going to finish this one off for Jade's Readathon and start this one, Pocket and Stubbs. I'm very excited. So the next vlog update is going to be so long. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Once completed, the characters are restored and you are returned to the world outside the book. And with that, I have completed the 100 acre wood 
location with Sal and Gabby Break the Universe by Carlos Hernandez. I really, really enjoyed this book and I would have enjoyed this book more had it actually been Sal and Gabby Breaking the Universe. I don't know if I missed something. I definitely didn't miss anything. I read this cover to cover. I read this physically because I don't have an audiobook of it. I don't even think there is an audiobook of it. I mean, I need I need to sit down and have a coffee and chat with you about this one because this was almost a five star. It was almost a five star. Mainly a five star because the characters are so wonderful. Like, Sal is such a brilliant main character. He's such a funny, charismatic why have I gone like a weird colour? I'm just gonna have to put up with the colour changes. I don't know why it does this. He's so funny. He's so quick-witted. What he can do, what this book is about, it's about Sal who can rip open the universe and sort of put his arm through and take something out of a different universe because there are loads of different like parallel universes and multiverses and things so he can literally put his hand through and there could be a chicken factory where he is putting his hand through and he can take out dead chicken and put it into his buddy's locker. That's the kind of premise that this is built on, that he can literally take things out of other universes. And when he does that to a bully, and he, you know, gets the bully into trouble and things, the window into the other universe doesn't close. But, like, each time he does that, it's kind of, there will be consequences for those actions. And not everybody can see him do this. Gabby can. He meets Gabby at the school that he's just transferred to. And she is also another fantastic character. She comes across as very cool to begin with because she is sort of like the journalist in this school and she kind of acts a bit like a lawyer for the bully even though she knows what he's done is wrong but there are other like like multi layers to all of these characters including the bully there's like so many layers to that which I found really endearing in this book I'm probably not making sense I never do but she ends up bonding with Sal and Turns out she can kind of do the same thing that he can. So that is what I thought was going to happen. I thought Sal and Gabby were going to do something that would break the universe. And they do something towards the end of the book that I'm not going to spoil for you. But there's something that is happening in Gabby's life to someone. And they go to a different universe to try and fix it. And they do. There's no like kind of cliffhanger to that. There's no evident breaking of the universe by the end of this. There's not no kind of calamity that happens. It's just like things do happen in this book but it's nothing that breaks the unit. I'm just so confused. Somebody mentioned this in one of the lives I did yesterday for Jade's 24-hour readathon and it was that they had read this and they thought it was more contemporary with sci-fi elements and I definitely get that because most of this is set at the high school and it's mainly just going through their regular high school kind of day and you know they do loads of different things then obviously Sal does these magician tricks and pulling things out of different universes that gets people scared of him because they can't see what's happening and they don't know what's happening so Sal goes around being this magician but it was definitely more focused on that. This perfectly balanced the normal so that when something extraordinary happened it felt quite real. Yeah this was almost a five star had it just like pulled through but I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for something big to happen because the second book the sequel is called Sal and Gabby be fixed the universe. So I was like, well, surely they do something catastrophic to break the universe, surely? You know, for the sequel to have that name, I thought they would break something. But they don't really break anything. They just pop in and out of universes and nothing really breaks. <laughs> the universe doesn't need fixing by the end of this. So maybe something happens at the start of the second one that is a big breaking of the universe. But then why didn't it just happen in this one? I don't understand. So yeah, I will still read it. I will still read the second one because I really enjoyed this. I love the characters in this. They are some of the best middle grade characters I've read. Like, And I'm being serious here when I say this. They were genuinely funny. And this is really brilliantly written in a way that it felt so real. And of course it did because more most of this is just quite normal. Fantastic character work. I just, I was waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen. And things did, but not in the way that I, I guess that's more my fault, isn't it? Like more fool me. But at the same time, I was just going off the title. And even on the back it says, their manipulation of time and space could put their entire universe at risk. There's this huge, you know, concept here 
that just does not happen. So I'm just, I'm confused. But I still really enjoyed this. Still enjoyed it. Four stars. So yesterday I did partake in Jade's 24 hour readathon. We did a few lives on Instagram. And then at 7pm I crashed. I crashed hard. I fell asleep. And I was actually in the middle of reading Pocket and Stubbs by Sophie Green. This was just an extra book that I just threw in there. I haven't managed to do a proper introduction to this or it won't even fit any of the prompts that are next to this. The next place I could have went is The Deep Woods and that's a book published before 2000. Mm, maybe this could have worked for The Wonderfalls but then if I use a wish to transport me to The Wonderfalls how will I get to the bookkeeper stronghold at the end? Because I can only get one wish and I can't bend that rule for my own readathon. I can't do it. I could go back up to the Brody Rail and do the Brody Rail twice and include Pocket and stubs in the brolly reel. But I'm going back up on myself. So I did crash hard. I was around 150 pages into this yesterday and yeah, I fell asleep. And then I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning and I started to read this again and I finished it and I thought it was really, really good. I gave it four stars. I can definitely see why Jade loves this so much. This follows Lil, who is a reporter in, well, she's a wannabe reporter, in Pelican City. And let me tell you, Pelican City felt like Gotham City. It had the kind of like kingpins and the mobs and all that kind of grime. Is that the right word? Like the grimy atmosphere to it. This definitely did feel noir-esque as well, which I love to see. I love saying this is very noir-esque. And I felt that all the way through. Sophie Green is so fantastic at painting this picture. There are, it, th this is filled with like pathetic fallacy, which is, you know, like when like the weather is kind of indicative of the atmosphere in this and stuff. I, it's been a long time since I've been to school, okay? So getting back to the plot, sorry. Nedley appears in Lil's room one day and he has been murdered and he doesn't know what happened to him and he is a ghost and only Lil can see him. So she has to sort of like solve this case. She ends up partnering with Abe who was this ex-police investigator but now he works as a sort of private investigator but he's kind of fallen a bit hard on life and he looks quite rugged and he's missing a hand. This could have worked for, for the Wonderfalls to be fair but I can't I can't bend the rules, I'm afraid. So yeah, she ends up partnering up with him, and, but he can't see Nedley, and they try and find out what happened to him, and it's it was such a great action-packed mystery, and it had quite a few twists and turns that I wasn't quite expecting, especially to do with the kind of the villains in this world. It had this kind of climax that lasted quite a few pages and it was rather exciting because I know a lot of times in middle grade a lot of things are wrapped up too nicely but this one it was done really well. It was very exciting, very action-packed. Um, Lil is such a great character as well. She can really hold her own especially with the dynamic she has with Abe because Abe's a lot older than her and he has some kind of past with her mother which we don't really know what happens or anything like that, you know, the connection there. But Lil is very tough and she she cracks him. She manages to get him to help her with her investigation. And just seeing their kind of, their bond was very interesting to watch unfold. They had such like, great chemistry together. And the same with Lil and Nedley. So yeah, it was really fun. But yeah, I finished this about an hour ago. I just kept reading and reading and reading. Because I really needed to finish this because I need to actually finish my own readathon. <laughs> this was literally just to read for the readathon. What better way to do the readathon than to finish Sal and Gabby and also read and I was hoping to finish this yesterday Pocken and Stubbs but it just didn't happen to them. So that means I can now go to the bookkeeper stronghold. It's 3 p.m today so I really need to finish this next book in the next nine hours which is uh, it's totally doable and I will show you why. So this is the last time. <laughs> Huzzah, you're almost at your final destination. The bookkeeper stronghold is near, but you need to cross a part of the snow sea to get there. You look around, but for miles and miles, all you see is snow, and as you squint, you notice it's shifting. Monsters! You are warned about these creatures. They're called leviathans, and they're terrifying. You have nowhere to run as they approach. That is, until you hear an approaching sleigh. The leviathans change course and head for it. They circle around to pick you up and a song weaver on board manages to battle the monsters and protect you and the crew from a grisly fate. The crew introduce themselves and you ask them to take you to the bookkeeper's stronghold. They agree to take you and it isn't long before you reach the gates. The entire place is protected by the witch, trapping everyone inside and keeping everyone out. You walk confidently to the gate with all the knowledge and power you have gained from the stories you have read on your travels and your moment has come. 
In order to save the stronghold and defeat the witch, you must read the next book in a series. For my final Believe Thon location and to complete the Believe Thon 2 Journey to the Stronghold quest, I will be reading The Wizards of Wands Twice Magic by Cressida Cowell. And I am so excited to read this because I just know I will be able to just sit back and relax with this one because it's not going to be too hard to read. It's filled with beautiful illustrations and I also have the audiobook which is narrated by David Tennant. And I read the first book, The Wizards of Once, with the audiobook and physically and it was like, it was a fantastic experience. The voices that David Tennant does and the illustrations in this just really come together so brilliantly. So I'm really excited to just lie back and listen to that and read it and just have a fantastic last few hours of Believeathon. So I will wrap up this vlog tonight because it will be the very, very end of Believeathon. I'm so excited because I will be announcing Believeathon 3 in like an hour's time on Twitter and Instagram, or at least I will be revealing the logo that I've made for it, which I will show later in the video as well. And I'm so excited. I've been sitting on that for ages. I made it like a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago, because I've just been so excited about it. I've been planning it. I've been doing so much for it lately and I shouldn't be. I should have been focused on Believe Thon 2 and I am behind. I haven't edited any of this vlog up to this point and I'm scared. I need to head off and finish my quest so it's the last one. <laughs> Once complete, you find yourself transported inside the stronghold now that you have been able to penetrate its defences. The witch, in rage, tries to banish you, but you're much too powerful now. With all the strength and courage you can muster, you finally defeat her. The curse has been lifted and the people of the bookkeeper stronghold have been freed. From outside, the stranger who sent you on the quest approaches you and thanks you greatly. He reveals himself. It's Gav of the bookkeeper stronghold. You have saved his stronghold, and in doing so, you have restored imagination in the land of Make Believe Thon. The end. So, I have finished The Wizards of Wands Twice Magic by Cressida Cowell. I literally just spent the last few hours reading this. It's 11 pm, so that means there's still an hour left of Believe a Thon. I listened to the audiobook as I was reading this. I was very entranced by it, but I've still been trying to keep up with all of the notifications on social media and things, and I did announced believe -a 3, but I will get to that in a second. I want to talk about this book first. So, I really enjoyed this one. Again, I gave it four stars. I gave it the same rating as The Wizards once, but my co-pile rating is a bit higher because I think I do prefer this one over the first one. It still had all the things that I really enjoyed about The Wizards of Once. You know, we had Zor, who is this wizard, and Wish, who is this warrior, and it was their sort of story in the first one of how wizards and warriors are enemies, or brought up to be enemies, and things happen, they realise they have a much bigger enemy, and they kind of work together. So in this one, it furthers that story, it has more of the stakes because yeah, witches are the bigger threat and there are more of them in this one and there are things that the characters have to do and it was just really fun. It was really wonderful. It's not like high stakes that much but there was like points in this especially towards the end where it got quite tense and I was enjoying that. <laughs> David Tennant's narration as well. Oh my gosh like I don't know how I could have read this book without it because he is just a great actor. He is such a great voice actor. He really embodies the character so well. And now I'm going to have to read the third one with the audiobook and the fourth one. All of them with the audiobook because it's just the way to experience these books. But it was just wonderful. A great way to finish off the believe -a 2. And obviously I can't go really in depth with this one because it's a sequel. And that is what this prompt was for the Boogie of a Stronghold to read the sequel. And I'm really glad I chose this one. It had so much intrigue as well. I want to know who the unknown narrator is. Let me know who it is. I think it might be the spoon. I That is my theory. I think it might be the spoon. No context whatsoever. If you do not know, it's not a spy or anything. But I think the spoon is an unknown narrator, okay? But yeah, that's just like, that's just one of the parts about why this is just so like crazy and bizarre. But like in a really good way. 
and oh, I just, I mentioned this in this vlog as well when I talked about how to train your dragon, but Cressida Cow just knows how to embody childhood imagination. It's just great. I love it. Can't wait to read the final two in the series. I think there's only going to be four books in the series, so I'm halfway through the series and it's quite sad. But yeah, with this, that means that Believeathon 2 is over. <laughs> and I want to give a huge, 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 huge thank you to every single person who were involved with Believeathon 2, to everybody who sent me so many messages over the last two weeks and who tagged Believeathon and hashtagged Believeathon and showed me their photos and their progress with the quest and all of that good stuff. I've seen every single one. I think I've liked and retweeted every single one as well because it's great for me to find some recommendations. I found so many great recommendations from it. So many things I've added to my own list and things that I really want to read. So yeah, just thank you so much for all of that and I really appreciate it. And I didn't think it would be as big as it was. You know, I didn't think we would get as many participants as the first Believe-a-thon, which lasted a month. So I mean, Believe-a-thon 2 isn't even over yet, but I, I do want to have a look to see what the page total is. I haven't checked yet, there's still an hour left. And of course not everybody's filled in the form, but this is just like a good indication of all of the, the books that have been submitted. So it's definitely over 430,000 pages read, and we had 608,000 in the first Believe-a-thon, and that was a month long. This was only two weeks, and we got to 430,000 pages read. Like, honestly, thank you so much. If you haven't filled in the form, I'm keeping it open until the very end of May 31st or June 1st, just depending on time zones, just so that people who might not have filled in the form yet can fill it in. And also because I haven't, I'm not officially like closing, closing it. So if you're still doing some Believeathon reads in the last week of May, that's absolutely fine. I know how tough it's been on everyone to try and cram everything into two weeks. So I will keep it open for the next week. It'll not affect the giveaway. So I will still be doing the giveaway for the schools and the £100 children's book hamper. So I will choose a winner on June 1st and I will let you guys know. I will notify the winner and then I will announce it on Twitter and Instagram and everything. And the Upgrade Junior winner as well. Somebody is getting the June Alcray Junior box for free, courtesy of Alcray Junior. So thank you so much Alcray Junior for doing that for me. That's amazing. So I'll tell you a little bit about Believeathon 3 now then because I have been planning it for a little while now. I haven't completely finished it or anything. I'm, of course not. I barely really scratched the surface of it. But I have made a really cool logo so I will put that in here just to show you guys. Deep in the deep woods in the land of make believe -a lies a manor. Inside this manor a mystery has begun. A precious spell book, the Maleficarum, has been stolen from a safe chamber and if it isn't returned to its podium by the end of November, the most dangerous magic in the world will be unleashed. Can you solve the mystery? Believeathon 3 will be running the entire month of November, the same way that the first Believeathon did. So I'm doing like full month November, mini Believeathon in May, full month November, mini believe on me and stuff like that. That's that's the way I wanted to do it. It is gonna be like sort of mystery theme, but you don't have to read mystery books for it. I mean, there might be a prompt for um, a mystery book maybe. Other than that, it's pretty much free reign. There are gonna be prompts again. And the idea behind this one is that each prompt you complete, you will gain a clue. So there will be 10 possible clues to collect from 10 different prompts. I am hoping there will be a map for this one, maybe to the manor and its ground so that you can find the clues sort of thing, but I'm not promising anything, that's just a, a dream at the minute, so let's see how that goes, but there will be a compendium, and it will be like a storybook again, so I'm excited, I hope you're excited, I will of course still be active on the Believeathon Twitter and Instagram, so do follow those, and especially if you want some sneak peeks and clues to what's going to be coming to Believeathon 3, then that will be awesome, and yeah, that's pretty much it for my <laughs> Believeathon 2 vlog my wrap up then. So these are all of the books that I read for Believeathon 2 over the two weeks. I read Green Glass House by Kate Milford, Cogheart by Peter Bunzel, Dark Whispers by Vashti Hardy, Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, How to Train Your Dragon by Cressida Cowell, The Infinite Lives of Maisie Day by Christopher Edge, The Lonely Heart of Maybelle Lane by Kate O'Shaughnessy, 
Sun Gabby Broke the Universe by Carlos Hernandez, Pocken and Stubbs by Sophie Green, and The Wizards of Wands Twice Magic by Cressida Cowell. So this was, I think, 3,600 pages. Not bad for two weeks, not bad. Yeah, I'm just so happy with them because I pretty much love them all. I don't think I gave any book lower than a 3.5, which is fantastic. And I got some five stars out of this as well, so I'm really happy about that. So yeah, that's that's it. I hope you guys had a great Believathon 2. I hope you guys enjoyed your quests. I hope you had so much fun. The main thing is that you had fun and that you maybe found your favourite new middle grade, maybe. That would be awesome. That's always a goal behind Believathon is for you guys to find your new favourite middle grade. So thanks so much for everything for the past, not even just the past two weeks, but the past couple of months ever since I announced Believathon 2. It's just been amazing. And I really appreciate it. And I love you guys. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and comment down below. Let me know how your quest went, what you read and everything Believathon related. I want to know. Subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you in the next video. Bye.